Hello and welcome to Ink and Inspiration, the interview series produced by Write and Vibe Publishing. In this series, we dive deep into the world of writing and all the incredible individuals who support it. From authors to publishers, indie bookstores to agents, conference organizers, and more, we speak with the people who make up the vibrant writing community ecosystem. Whether you're an aspiring author or a seasoned professional, this series is for you. This is your host, Corey. It's time to get lit. Welcome to the very first episode of Ink and Inspiration. In this episode, we get the chance to speak with the renowned writer, Rachel Cargill, to discuss her upcoming book and the life experiences that have shaped her into the fearless and dynamic writer and business person that she is today. So let's just get right into it. For this question, I want you to go ahead and tell us all about the Loveland Foundation, the Great Unlearn, your writings, and your bookstore, Elizabeth. My name is Rachel Cargill, and I am an entrepreneur, an author, a, a, mm. <laughs> I'm thinking about all the titles that have, that I've been named, but now I'm making a conscious decision to name my own. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an author, I'm a philanthropic innovator, and I'm just a black girl out in the world trying to uh, do things that align with my values and support my community. Right now, that looks like uh, it lives in two spaces. The first is my company called The Loveland Group, and within it, we have ventures that uh, lean into community, gather community, and just invest in our collective uh, knowledge, understanding, and freedom. What lives within The Loveland Group is my bookstore, Elizabeth's Bookshop and Writing Center, which centers and celebrates marginalized voices, particularly voices of color. I also have The Great Unlearn, which is a donation-based learning platform where we center the work of Black and queer academics, um, bringing their work from behind the ivory tower and putting it into the public for us to collectively learn. Um, and I also have... <clears throat> What is the Loveland Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm of the work that I do. The Loveland Foundation offers uh, access to therapy at no cost for black women, girls, and non-binary people across the country. And uh, that team is doing a lot of really incredible work as well. You have a passion for marginalized people. How did you get started with wanting to work with them when they're excluded by so many other groups? Mm-hmm. I like that question. The reason I do center on marginalized people in my work really started with me recognizing the marginalization of Black women within feminism. And I realized the ways that Black women weren't... Um, weren't being included in what was being fought for, although they were being expected to show up on the ground. And I really wanted to um, have an opportunity to center, celebrate, highlight, and support Black women in ways that it just wasn't happening in other spaces. And that has poured into me centering and celebrating marginalized voices in every aspect that I do. And what I love about the way that I'm able to do my work is my creativity allows me to have all these branches, a bookstore, a learning platform, but it all centers the same thing. And so I feel very lucky to have kind of this uh, landscape of creativity that all funnels through my values and my intention of who I want to serve. A lot of times creatives have a bunch of different ventures. Um, was there ever a time as a creative and as a passionate person where people kind of thought you were all over the place and I guess basically decided not to support you? Mm. Uh, I think that this shame that creatives sometimes have about being a jack of all trades. Uh, we're often told that you have to choose one thing and be good at it. And so long ago when I decided to get into this space of entrepreneurship, of creativity, of writing and artistry, I decided that my one thing that I can let people know I am doing is supporting marginalized people, particularly black women and girls. And I will spend this lifetime trying to be creative, finding ways to do just that. Uh, that has been my own 
settling with that feeling because I absolutely have felt it and I absolutely hear it. I, I, I can hear my mother's voice saying that, I can hear teachers' voices saying that, I can hear other entrepreneurs who felt more comfortable doing one thing and I don't think that this is the way to be a creative entrepreneur, but I have decided that I have chosen my one thing that sits so squarely in my being and part of my artistry is being able to find many ways to live that out. You said that it fits squarely within your being. Does that come from how you were raised? I'd like you to go a little bit more into your background and how you got to this moment. Were you poured into by your caregivers? Were you poured into by your teachers? Um, sometimes writers will say they've always been a writer. Was this always just a part of your being? The idea of this all sitting squarely within me really comes from what I see as the seed that my mother put in me of curiosity. My mom really always celebrated and pushed me to be interested and to be interesting and to find ways to um, look at the world differently. I, I talk about how on rainy days, my mom would like give me a bowl and say, I wonder how many worms you could go find. And like, I would just go collect worms. Or I also tell the story about how uh, my mother who had a disability, she had polio since she was five. So my mother was on crutches my whole life. Um, and she used to tell me to do things like uh, if there were some girls on the other side of the park, she'd say, go find out what their name is for me. And she or she would say, I wonder if you're able to climb to the top of those monkey bars. Go tell me what the what the landscape looks like from up there. And so those were things that I, I often questioned myself. I don't know if she was doing it to prove myself to me or as a disabled mother, prove myself to her to know that her daughter would be well and be able to be out in the world and do hard things. But that type of engagement with my mother really won as I said, seated my curiosity, but also I had many opportunities to prove to myself what I was capable of because my mom often pushed me. And so that really continues to push me to try things now as an adult. I wonder if I can open a bookstore. I wonder if I could write a book. I wonder if I can live in New York City. All of these ways of being curious about my capabilities, something that my mom used as a tool to grow me has also been a tool to sustain me. And, and it really has been a lens through which I find so so much fun um, and motivation and purpose through my work. On your page, you are very reflective. If we could go into your relationship with your mother, I know she passed and I am very sorry for your loss. I do know how that feels. For me, it'll be five years in October. And so I know the different phases when you post about them and I'm like, oh, she's spot on. Can you talk about how her death affected your writing? As I've had more conversation with other writers, with other people who have, who have experienced grief in the midst of writing something, one thing that has been discussed amongst us is the phenomenon of how sometimes when you're writing about a person, you liter pe many people have not been able to get the full book out until that person has passed. And it's often because there's something in that book that they don't want them to read or something that they're struggling with about a person close to them knowing their truer thoughts or what their truth is as it compares to what their truth might be. And so I think there was a bit of that in it for me because in the book, um, at the time of writing the book was the first time I was really reflective about how my mother raising me might have affected me in more negative ways. I had certainly romanticized my childhood in a way that uh, completely took me off the grid of making deeper considerations about how my childhood was showing up in my adulthood and things I needed to heal through or fix. And uh, so in that time, I think I was writing things on the page that I had never talked to my mother about per se, or that I didn't feel like I could talk to my mother about, or that might've put a light on her that suggested that she quote unquote, didn't do her job well. Uh, and while, not all of that is true, it still sat heavy with me. So I think that that phenomenon of not being able to really get the book out until that person passes certainly played a role in, uh, in how I wrote. But also, I think that one of the most transformative things in my writing because of the passing of my mother is um, 
well, I guess I'll give this the, the story that while my mother was in hospice, I had read her a bit of the book. I wanted her to hear it. And so I read her a little, I think it was a little bit of testing for me to like see what her reaction would be. And so I read her a bit that included something about her. And at the end of me reading it, she looks up and goes, wow, that was way better than I thought it would be. <laughs> like in terms of my skill as a writer. And so that in that moment, I laughed, of course, but I also was like, she is so unaware of what my work is. She's so unaware of how I show up in the world, which many mothers are. And so since her passing with so much of my writing being, you know, it's dripping in my grief, it's showing up on the page. This is the first time in my life I felt like my mom is part of my work. I certainly feel like she's here. I certainly feel that she's uh, seeding me thoughts for deeper consideration. I feel like I'm having conversations with her that I never could have had while she was alive. I feel like I'm able to think freer than I ever have been able to because of my mother's expectations that lived on me during her life here. And so, my relationship between my writing and my mother has been one of the greatest gifts of grief because I I felt I kind of felt that distance between her and my work and now it feels like she is my work as I'm writing more and more about grief and I feel so grateful for that. So you have 63,000 likes on Facebook, 54.6 thousand follows on Twitter, and 1.6 million followers on Instagram. Mm -hmm. As writers, sometimes we are supported by everybody else. And then we just want our family and friends yeah. to not yeah. only cheer us on, but when you ask if they read it, they're kind of like, well. Yeah. And so um, did you ever feel like you were, quote unquote, unsupported by your familial environment? I like this question. It's making me think thoughts I haven't thought before, and I, I appreciate that. You know, my work for so much of it was a bit of a rebellion against my mother. And not against my mother herself, but against all the ideas that she poured into me about who I was, what I was supposed to be doing, what my boundaries and parameters were. And so my writing was often a space away from her happily that allowed me to be as feminist, as queer, as black, as girl, as wild as I wanted to be and within my own definition. And so I don't think I've ever had a craving for my mother to read my work because I inherently thought she either wouldn't um, understand it or wouldn't align with it. And both of those were fine with me. Um, I had, as you said, a whole slew of people who I was able to be in conversation and camaraderie with around these ideas and intentions that I had. And so I never really had a craving and this what this is really bringing up for me is that my writing has been such a like harvest space for me to explore myself and explore my thoughts and explore my ideas outside of who I was told I was or who I felt I was on a trajectory to becoming by being a poor black Christian girl in the Midwest and moving to New York, being able to write these things out was an escape a bit. But I also will say, I, I don't even know if I so much am leaning into identifying myself as a writer. I really identify myself as a thinker who gets to say it out loud, who has an audience to share it with, because I never necessarily had a dream of becoming a writer, of publishing a book, of people reading my work, but I was always celebrated for being a good writer, like the actual skill of it. Throughout school, it was the easiest thing for me. It was something I always looked forward to, and it was something that I often got celebrated for by either my teachers or my mom. It was something that I was good at, and so I feel, com I feel like wildly grateful that the thing that comes easy to me and that people seem to enjoy also aligns with the way I've been able to make a living. Um, but I really do consider myself and my work as like a container for my thinking more so than just the fact that I'm putting things on the page. And so with that, you know, the, the separation between how my work was taken and was consumed by my family here in Ohio, Ohioans in general, my mother, the people I grew up in in church, 
I never desired or even considered it because writing has really been my way to explore who I might be outside of all of that. You write about tough topics that would challenge beliefs, challenge people to look at themselves internally, Mm -hmm. think deeper, and really evaluate how they look at others. Has there ever been a time where you struggled to put something out because you knew you might face backlash? Um, Has there ever been backlash against what you write, how you feel, who you're who you are, um, things like that. So I absolutely have experienced and even expected backlash in my work. What I'm talking about is so rooted in identity. And when identity is questioned or, you know, challenged, that is very hard, whether it's your identity as a white person in America who feels patriotic and wants to keep that, whether it's people having their identity of being a nice person and recognizing that some of the things that they've been doing have been oppressive to other people. And as a Black woman in America, we have ongoing experiences with oppressions, aggressions, grievances. And when I get to this point of conflict with whoever's reading my work or whoever's being confronted with my work, that confrontation isn't any harder than what I've been going through (laughs) or what black women as a whole collectively collectively experience. And I, I get a lot of comments that say, Rachel, I can't believe you're able to, you know, show up and do the work in that way and how and experience all of that conflict. And I really feel like it was just something I was supposed to do because I didn't feel that type of strain that other people relay that they might have felt or that they feel just reading it or just witnessing the conversations I have. So I think it also comes with a bit of gratefulness from me on my end that for whatever reason I was equipped with the things needed to do that work and I'm grateful that I did it in the exact way that I did at the time. Your mother had a disability and your older sibling was or is addicted to drugs? Yes, I have two older sisters and both, both okay. one is addicted to drugs and one to alcohol and I've been fairly estranged from them for a while. Does something like that help you see differently? Um, for example, my mother worked for the state for the developmentally disabled um, and being around People who function differently was what made me grow up with a special place in my heart for people who are different. Do you feel like growing up with your mother being disabled and your siblings having an addiction, um, do you feel like that helped you have a heart to fight for people who are already like, um, do you see where I'm going? Yes, I see where you're going. And what what it's bringing up for me is... You know, the truth is my mother's disability and my sister's addiction more than anything fueled my rage in the work that I do. The, 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 um, you know, this like righteous rage of all of the ways that marginal, marginalization limited us to access to things that would make us well, that might be able to support my mom moving through the city, that might have been able to support my sisters with their addiction long, long ago to where it wouldn't have gotten to this place. The ways that I have um, witnessed what happens in the foster care system with my own family, you know, what could have been done or what I see done for other groups that wasn't available to people I know, to people I've lived with, to people I call family. And so witnessing those things, living those things really more than anything fueled my rage with the knowledge I had of just how hard it can get, just how bad it can get. And so I didn't need to understand what it was like to be a single mother in the welfare system who was trying to get a job and go to school and pay her car note and pay for gas because I'd seen it, I'd witnessed it and I'd lived in the midst of it. And so all of those personal, personal connections I had to a lot of the oppressions, a lot of the injustices, and a lot of the rage that I had in my body witnessing how uneasy it was for people to live their day-to-day lives, um, that certainly showed up in my work and I think will continue to. (laughs) So you have your book out. Um, If you could say the title and briefly what it's about and the release date. My book is called A Renaissance of Our Own, a memoir and manifesto on reimagining. Um, Its debut date is May 16th. 
and it's a book where I'm able to really just go through different times in my life um, and different areas of my life and how I reimagined what was possible in that space. Uh, each chapter is titled with different parts of reimagining, everything from reimagining feminism and the way that I really combed through the feminist movement looking for uh, racism and how it really affects uh, black women and our collective liberation, uh, reimagining education, talking about how I got into and subsequently left Columbia University um, with an attempt to really study and learn outside of whitewashed academic institutions, uh, reimagining um, family and looking at the ways uh, you know, we have that opportunity to have a chosen family and really make connections with people uh, outside of what Western, the Western world has told us is most important. Um, Reimagining love, and I talk about uh, being queer, I talk about being non monogamous, I talk about the ways. Uh, I was able to be in more relationship with myself and what that offered me to uh, people who I was in relationship with. Um, reimagining business, reimagining rest. There's all of the ways that I have approached uh, the world, my world, uh, how I've been kind of curating a life that looks different than what I was told it had to be. Your book is based on reimagining and kind of like your adventures on unlearning. Did you have to do any research in your writing to ensure the accuracy in your storytelling? Yeah, well, I definitely had support on the book. I had research assistants who were able to uh, support in a lot of the more academic material that is woven throughout the book, which I loved because there are so many footnotes that people will be able to touch on to continue in their own interest and in their own learning, their own unlearning as well. Um, but. I think a lot of the, what, what I pulled from was the previous five years of work that I'd been doing, conversations I'd been having uh, on social media, in person on my lecture tours, and uh, being able to pull from those things was really wonderful because I, it was a first person, um, very intimate uh, relationship to the material in the book. But what I will say to, to speak to that question is that as I said, in the midst of writing this book, I had a huge moment of personal reflection and consciousness. And so what did have to be fact-checked were the stories I had been telling myself about my family, about my own understanding of self. So when I would write something and I'd pick up the phone and call my mom and say, what did happen that day? Or how did I react? There were many times where what I remembered was not necessarily true. And that also was part of the space of healing that I'm in now, recognizing all of the narrative I had had to craft for my own survival, for my own mental health. And this book, being a memoir, um, really challenged me and put me on this path towards uh, being a bit more critical about, about the stories I've told myself and uh, why I had to create them and what narratives I can understand now to help me move forward. You're young. <laughs> Thanks. 34. <laughs> Was there a point when you were writing when you thought you were too young to put out a memoir? Oh my gosh. Yes, I often feel like I'm too young to put out a memoir. Um, but I also feel like everything that I write in this book that takes place from birth until age probably 33 or 32, um, I think that there is a community of people who need to read that too. I don't feel like it was frivolous to write this book. I really was writing to a version of me that would have needed these words, needed this direction, needed this uh, these questions. And so I, I certainly sit with that feeling of feel because I signed the book four years ago. So it also, I felt it then and life has given me some material <laughs> between then and now. So. Um, I, because I also am really struggling with 
even now, you know, I recorded the audiobook recently, which makes you read through your entire manuscript. And some of the things I have already kind of grown from, I have new understandings of. And the only way to not completely rip myself apart over that is that someone needs that understanding that was there in that way at that moment. And so um, I, I, I can sit well with it, uh, and it's wonderful to to see myself reflected at that time in that way. How do you balance the aspect of creative freedom with what you've written and the demands of the market? Um, traditional publishing is really based on what's popular right now. So how do you balance what you're writing about and what the market is telling you that they need? This is a great question <laughs> because um, the truth is that what, I, I, as I mentioned, I signed this book in 2018 and what I signed the book for was to write a nonfiction anti-racism book. And that's what I was writing when I started this book. I was doing a lot more teaching, a lot more research, a lot more uh, kind of the work that I was doing on Instagram at the time of breaking down, unpacking what white feminism was and how it affected black women. And a lot of the energy put into that work in that way back then, as well as the book back then, was this call to white women to do better. In 2020, as I was con as I continued to write the book and so much of my personal writing was happening on Instagram talking about the racial uprisings, the murder of George Floyd, I was burnt out from writing about race and I ref and I was really refusing to use my creativity, my time and uh my creative flow on that, <laughs> on that in particular. So I actually called my agent and I said, I will pay you the advance back. I don't wanna write this book anymore. And it became a conversation between us of Rachel, tell us exactly what you want and how you wanna do it and we'll figure it out. And I told them I want, uh, because between when I signed the book and when, uh, between when I signed the book and when this book was published, I had, my follower count had grown from maybe like 10K to over a million at that time. And so I told them, I wanna be paid more money because you're going to make more money because there's more people who know my name. I want an all black editing team and I want to write something else. I don't wanna write this book. And they answered all my demands. And so this book is not what it was before. And it was because I had an exhaustion and I refused to do it. And I also knew that I had talent that they were going to make money from regardless. And so that is what I do. I, I change course and I changed my expectations and I think that as a writer there is a practice within us within each of us I think everyone kind of has that core value that really all of their work works around whether they're aware of it or not I think it's fun when we discover it because we could be more intentional but I think when people look over their art at the end of their life you can see kind of a through line and so I'm grateful that I know my through through line so I can really apply it. So I think that when people read what the book is now, it's going to be very much so still centered on that intention of um, being critical and being thoughtful and being re reflective um, and you know, applying my the framework that I talk about in the book of knowledge, empathy, and action, particularly in our social justice work, but also in how we're thoughtful and considerate about ourselves. Can you discuss your all-time favorite book? Um, I know you've you've read a lot, but if you could give the title and why you love it uh, for your favorite one. Ooh, let me think. I don't think I have an all-time favorite book. I don't think there's a book that sits in my head as like my all-time favorite, but I will say that I love books that chronicle the lives of Black girls. I think that they're so... Um, intriguing, uh, they're so critical for me. It gives me kind of a space to be thoughtful about my own self as a black girl. Um, I have been really, you, my mom read to me so much as a child uh, and 
you know, I'm thinking about the first excitement I had in stories about a black girl. It was Addie from American Girls. And I remember we were at Costco and they were selling big box of these American Girls. And I got the book and I really loved um, being able to really see myself in this character to wonder what I would do and be so uh on point with who the character was to where I could really imagine it. And so I've always been intrigued by books that reflect me in some way and also challenge me to be more like or be less like or uh, just be thoughtful about how I fit into the world that's on the page. Uh, so that, that has been part of my joy of reading. But I'll also say that I really love children's books most. I have a big collection of children's books in my home. I'm really uh, shocked by the stories that can be told in such short number of pages. I love the illustrations and how the illustrations are part, there's parts of the story that we get from the illustrations alone. Um, yeah, I just love books in general and that's one of the greatest gifts my mother gave me was my love for reading and I'm grateful that um, it stayed and it's here and in my own life with my bookstore. Do you have an all-time favorite author? And if you do, who is it and why? <laughs> I really, I, I think that, I think that my trouble around naming a favorite author and a favorite book right now is because I'm really reading so much and I'm like, oh, I love this about them and I love this about her, I love this about him. And so it's hard for me to choose one, but I will say that I'm deeply moved by, um, the work of Alice Walker. I'm deeply moved by, um, I'm also, I'm thinking about people like um, Maya Angelou who were able to do memoirs in a way, like how do you have so many memoirs? Like you really lived a life and you really stretched it out in a way that pulls us in at, and is riveting. And I think that's really beautiful, this opportunity to relay yourself through books over and over again. Um, I really love uh, Joan Didion. I have been studying her work a lot as well. Uh, I guess I'm into memoirs these days, I guess, <laughs> with my with my own coming out. Um, Jamaica Kincaid. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I love, I love black women. I love women writers. I love uh, stories that are part of a reimagining and unlearning uh, that make me question myself and question the world. I love those kinds of things. Okay, so this is kind of like a fun question. Um, if your book on reimagining everything was turned into a rom-com. Ooh, love this for me. <laughs> it definitely could be. <laughs> um, who would play the lead roles and what would they get into? I don't even know. I actually want to say, I, I would love to play myself. I want to like, like, ooh, could I act? Who would I be as an actress? <laughs> that idea of pushing myself and figuring out what I was capable of. But I really, um, ooh, okay, okay. In my film of me, I want Tessa Thompson to play me. And then in the book, I tell the story of the first time I slept with a woman, and I would definitely want that scene to be in there. And the woman would be played by, who would it be played by? Wow, I love this question. And now I'm building this whole thing out in my head. Like Amber Riley. And then, <laughs> I would definitely want to play out scenes with my mother. I think that those would be really fun as well. And I would definitely want that to be played by like Felicia Rashad, who's very, who reminds me of my mother in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, I would love like all the New York scenes. I love New York City so much and I would love just like a whole shoot in New York City. Yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> okay, so let's get into the bookstore part of the interview. What sets Elizabeth's apart and how did you choose to use your middle name of Elizabeth as the name for mm. the bookstore? Yeah, so the thing that is central to Elizabeth's and the reason why I created it as a bookstore was because one, I had just moved back home from New York City to Ohio and in New York, 
sitting in a bookstore and writing, I feel like I'm surrounded by future bestsellers and it's so inspiring to see all the names on the shelf. And so I wanted to have that feeling in Ohio as well. And that was a big, uh, a big push for me. You know, a lot of my work centers in me having an experience and wanting others to have it as well. And I think that this certainly followed that through line. Um, of my work, but also I wanted a place that centered and celebrated voices of color that will inevitably give us more nuanced, critical um, ideas about ourselves and the world. And um, I think we do that really well on our shelves. The name of the bookstore, Elizabeth's, came, uh, I, I really call it a gift to my younger self. When I was younger, I used to beg my mom to call me Elizabeth. <laughs> thought it was a way cooler name than Rachel. I used to like write a note that said, dear teachers, Rachel will now be called Elizabeth and ask my mom to sign it <laughs> so that I could take it in. It was, it was something that I used to, it's so silly, like just as a kid wanting to be anything besides exactly what you are. <laughs> and so, um, and Elizabeth is, Elizabeth is my middle name. And so I wanted to name the bookstore Elizabeth as a gift to my younger self. Like there you get to be called Elizabeth. And it's centered in the thing that I love so much as a child, which was reading. And uh, so, yeah, I definitely count the bookstore as a gift to my younger self. What events and programs do you offer to help engage with the community? Yeah, so uh, we do a lot of things online because of my large personal audience. A lot of the audience of the bookstore and the community of the bookstore is online. And um, I enjoy a lot of the author events to celebrate authors who have books that come out and are debuting. Here on the ground in Akron, we have uh, open mic nights where we're able to hear the work of people. They used to be online and we've moved them to in person now. Uh, so that's been really wonderful. We also have a poetry group that meets on Saturday mornings and it is a really wonderful intergenerational interracial uh, community of people who are interested in uh, looking at and creating poetry. We also have children's reading uh, on Saturday mornings as well. Uh, my mother was the first person who did our Saturday morning readings and so it's a really special part of our programming that connects me to my mother and now we invite people from the community uh, professors, musicians, store owners to come in and connect with the children who come in to listen to a book on Saturday mornings. Can you speak to the role of indie bookstores in promoting local authors and their work? Yeah, I think independent bookstores have more of an vested interest in supporting local writers. One, because uh, being outside of the industry of publishing allows you a little more space to care. That's just inherent in capitalism. <laughs> and so uh, the opportunity to say we are using our shelf space to support local authors is a decision that usually only indie bookmakers can make because larger corporations would rather fill space with things that they know will make them money. We are allowed to let our values take center stage in deciding uh, where we are, how we are, and what we do. And that type of um, commitment, investment, and just interest in building community in that way is really important. And I'm grateful that we get to be one of the people who uh, stand in that space. How has Elizabeth's adapted to the rise of online bookstores, audiobooks, and ebooks? Well, Elizabeth started in 2020, so I think we came in the midst of all of that. And we had the very unique positioning, as I said, of me having an audience of millions of people. So one of the hardships of being a bookstore is sales, um, foot traffic, people coming in. And luckily, we have a bit of a balance with that because a lot of our sales are online through my audience who are seeing my book suggestions, who are wanting to read my book personally, or uh, just to want to support a black owned bookstore that they don't have in their own city. So they come to Elizabeth's online as an option to support black bookstores. That's certainly one of our biggest, uh, you know, biggest privileges is the large online audience we have. And I also think that with the rise of um, online books and audiobooks, I think that there is an opportunity for bookstores to be in relationship with all of that. And I am very 
uh, allured by the challenge. And I also, thirdly, I think that the bookstore isn't just for the book selling. As we said, there's these community events, there's reasons to come together. There's uh, opportunities to celebrate local people who are putting their art out into the world. And so um, our intention isn't just to get as many books out of the door as possible. It's also to bring people in and find opportunities. We have uh, local crafts people who we sell on our shelves as well. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling so burdened by the book crisis because we're so much more than just books. I know a lot of people who would love, absolutely love to open up a bookstore. What advice would you give to someone considering opening up their own bookstore? You know, my bookstore lives within uh, a space in Akron called The Well. It's a nonprofit who has uh, space in their building. And so we collaborate with them to where we are paying them rent uh, that ultimately goes to support the community. And that is where the bookstore lives. And so my advice is to look for ways for the bookstore to be in community with the good work other people are doing, because it's such a mutual aid opportunity. And uh, as we said, bookstores are more than just books. So uh, when you're moving into starting your bookstore, think about what else is there besides the books and how you can fold all of that in to both the uh, capability to run a bookstore and the opportunity to be in community. So now I'd like to know if you have a favorite interaction with a customer or like even a favorite experience from the bookstore, uh, what would that be? Well, I think I think right now some of my favorite interactions in the bookstore are the ways we are in community with other organizations. So outside of the individuals who come in to buy books, we also are doing things like providing books for community centers, providing books for classrooms. And so those moments where an organization says, hey, we want to give our community 200 copies of a banned book that we know you all carry because you hold the values. Those are some of my favorite ways to um, say, to, to recognize that we have exactly what the community is craving, something more critical, something outside of the whitewashed lens, um, something that is celebrated, um, that celebrates them. And so when we have full classrooms or full organizations that come to us, that those are my favorite um, times that we're able to uh, be booksellers and say, yes, we have exactly what you need. But I think that on an individual level, it's been really, it's been really awesome to see my childhood friends bringing their kids in to buy children's books, to uh, see my own teachers come in and see books on the shelves that were certainly uh, influenced by what they taught me and how I learned. Um, that's the special thing about having a bookstore in my hometown is that it is uh, a, it's like fertile ground for ongoing uh, growth and expansion to community. As you've talked, I've kind of like thought back on people like Audre Lorde, um, people like Bell Hooks, Toni Morrison, you know, the people from Ohio. Um, have any of them been influential in your life? There's so many people who came from Ohio. As we said, Nikki Giovanni, Toni Morrison, Audre Lorde. It is really it really makes me think about what the Midwest means to being a black person and what uh, being black in the Midwest speaks to so many other people's experiences. Um, and I'm really inspired by that. I'm really moved by the thoughts of um, what about this particular experience has seeded so many revolutionary voices, ones that I learn from, ones that I that I love to listen to, ones that comfort me. And um, I think it is really, I, I feel really dope being a black girl from Ohio and being part of a lineage of so many thoughtful, critical, uh, revolutionary, revolutionary people for sure. With you having been so accomplished, are you ever like amazed at your own accomplishments? Like when you look at yourself as young Rachel, are you living out her wildest dreams? Yes. <laughs> I, I, 
I write a lot about being in relationship with my younger self and my older self. And I feel very connected to both of them as co-creators of this life that I'm living. And when I think about the things I've been able to do, one, I feel so lucky that I have had so many like tremendous tremendously um, moving experiences in my life. But also I, I feel very much so that I've crafted it. I don't feel like I fell into it. I don't feel like it fell in my lap. I feel like so many things about who I was when I was younger have been giving me direction for where I find my grounding now. And I feel very dedicated to my older self to continue to do that because I know how it will be for her to look back at me now and say, thank you for what you did to allow me comfort, to allow me ease, to allow me celebration, to allow me community, the work that I'm doing now. And I, I think that as I said, I've my mother, my mother seeded in me this desire to see what is possible. And I very much so feel like I'm living my life that way. Every, every aspect of myself as they're listed out in chapters in my book have been opportunities for me to see what's possible in them to push myself to be to be curious to uh be rebellious to um really just be thoughtful and say how do i want this to be how do i want to feel in this life how do i want to feel uh at the end of it and i i am i i am amazed by the opportunity to do it. I'm amazed by what I was able to do years ago, you know, thinking back on all of the work and the networking and the traveling I was doing in my 20s, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I would never want to do that now. And I know there's so much now that I'm doing that when I'm in my 40s, I'll say, wow, I'm so grateful she did that because there's no way I have the energy or desire to do it at that time. And, um, you know, being writers is often a particular career that is particularly folded into just the living, your day-to-day -day living. And so having a career where one, I get paid to think out loud, which is like mind blowing in itself. <laughs> As a black girl who's often, we're often quieted and not told to think out loud. And to know that I have a career where people call me up and say, Rachel, can you think on the page for us? That is, I will forever melt at the thought that that is what I get to do. But also the way that building a life is what I know will be the material for my writing is is really special. You know, I this summer I signed myself up for like cello camp and for ceramics camp and for horseback riding camp and the thought about the things I'll think while I'm while I'm working with the clay, the ideas that will come to me while I'm able to play music to think that building a life is part of the work that I'm doing and that so much of my work is being able to pour into my foundation and just our collective conversation. Um, that is what I'm most in awe of and I, and I feel incredibly grateful and I feel, I feel like a bit of, uh, you know, my company is called Loveland and I think about my career as like this landscape that I am tilling, that I am inviting people on to, that I am um, just responsible for. And I feel very at home in this space on this landscape and I look forward to continuing to nurture it and see what grows of it. Do you have anything that you would want to leave the audience with? Any last thoughts, anything that you want them to know about you that is maybe not searchable online? I think as a writer, everything's searchable and online. <laughs> That's, I think that comes with the territory of being so vulnerable, but, um, I really love your thoughtfulness in considering the plight of a writer, the plight of a creative. And I think that speaking to that in particular, what's on my mind is that exploring, our sale, exploring ourselves is so worth it, is, is the best material that we can use in our art and in our work and in our lives and that taking the time to be reflective, to be thoughtful, to be critical, to be curious about ourselves is some of the best time we can spend as creatives because that will give more depth to our authenticity in our work, will give uh, us um, 
more complex thoughts and opinions and reflections that will, I think, grow our work. And it offers us a chance to really stand in our community as our individual with our stronger, more grounded perspectives. And I think that um, taking the time to explore ourselves is one of the kindest and most intentional things we can do for ourselves and for our community. All right, that is it for this episode. Whether you watched on YouTube, listened on your podcast platform, or saw a snippet on social media, I hope that it was valuable for you and that you will return for another episode of Ink and Inspiration. Have a peaceful, prosperous, and joy-filled rest of your day. Catch you later, social fam.